Well, it's great to be with you. I was asked to address you all on the topic, why and how you should be making disciples. And so I've chosen as my primary text, Matthew 28, if you want to turn there. I'll read it in your hearing. The focus will be on verses 18 through 20, but I want to read the entire chapter so we have something of an overall perspective before us. And before I do that, I don't know if Elle mentioned, but I do prison ministry. That's my primary vocation. Evangelism, apologetics is just part of that. It's part of who I am. It's part of what I love to do. And so that's how I'm known in this context. But I, I do prison ministry vocationally. And I tell you that just in case I at some point say stop robbing banks or something like that. <laughs> You'll understand why. Matthew 28, starting in the first verse, says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled, and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole away, uh, stole him away while he was asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And thus ends the reading of God's inspired and life-giving word. I'd ask that you pray with me now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We pray that we would hear it for what it is, your word, the word of the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, and the one who promised that he would be with us. We pray that we would hear it as it really is, that we would receive it, and that it would ultimately uh, move us to act differently than we did before knowing it, before hearing it. I pray that you'd be with me as I preach and with all of us as we hear, so that we might be more like you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, I was asked to address the topic of discipleship. And to do that, I want to focus on verses 18 through 20. And I'll give you something of an idea of the order in which I plan to look at this so that you can kind of follow along. And if you're getting tired of me, you'll kind of know when I'm getting close to the end. But one thing I'm going to do is sort of look at this a little bit out of order, but not uh, in a disordered way. Uh, I want to look at verse 18, or, or verse 19, really, the, the command itself, go and make disciples. And then I want to go back and look at what Jesus says in verse 18, because that's really what this command flows out of. Verse 18 says, therefore, right? go therefore. And then following that, I want to look at the promise of Christ in verse 20, where Jesus says that he'll be with us always. 
The reason I want to look at it this way is because I first want you to see from verse 19 something of the Herculean task that Jesus has laid upon his church. In verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's no light task. Jesus is asking us, not really asking, he's commanding us to go out and make disciples of the nations. Now, you know how hard it is to simply get your neighbor to come to faith in Christ or family members. Here, Jesus is saying not simply your neighbor, not simply your family members, all the nations. This is the task. Now, happily, it's not the task of one individual, and it's not the task only of the church at one period in time. This is a a generational task that the church is carrying out, but it's still a Herculean task, isn't it? And there's something surprising about this task, by the way. Uh, If you're following in Matthew's gospel up to this point, you've heard on a number of occasions statements that seem to limit this good news to Israel. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sent out his disciples and he says, don't go anywhere except to the cities of Israel. Don't go among the Gentiles. Then later in chapter 15, a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus and she wants Jesus to respond to her request. And Jesus said, I haven't been sent to anyone but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this command is somewhat jarring if you're following in Matthew's gospel. What is all this about? Why does Jesus not tell them to go to the Gentiles and in fact tell them not to go to the Gentiles? Well, while this is somewhat unexpected, In this regard, there's another sense in which Matthew has been getting you ready to think about this all along. One of my favorite observations when it comes to Matthew's gospel is right there in the first chapter, at least with respect to this issue, there you have the genealogy of Jesus. You've got this genealogy where you've got a bunch of begats, right? So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and most of us get bored of that sort of thing. But there's a lot of richness there. Uh, Every time I get bored with something in the Bible, I usually assume it's something wrong with me and not something wrong with the Bible. But I don't get bored here for various reasons, especially Matthew's genealogy, because Matthew does something that's unexpected. And And that's part of the reason, I think, when you get these genealogies in the Old Testament, it's setting a precedent. This is what you expect. So when somebody comes along and does something different, it stands out. Well, what stands out in Matthew's genealogy is he mentions women. Normally, it just mentions the men, this this father begat this son, this son begat this son, and so on. Not that it never happens, but it's not characteristic. Well, Matthew mentions women. Now, every word is deliberately chosen in Scripture because it's inspired, but also because they had a limited amount of page that they could use. They had scrolls, and these had to be of a certain length before they became unwieldy. That's why all the books of the New Testament fall within a, a pretty similar range if they're longer books, the Gospels uh, and so forth, the book of Revelation, the book of Acts. But this thing about the women being mentioned is significant because all of them are, they're not only women, they're all Gentiles. And they're all Gentiles who are known for their scandalous lives. Uh, It mentions Tamar in the genealogy of Jesus. She's not a descendant of Abraham. And she was known for tricking Jacob into having relations with her. So she's not known as a reputable woman. Now, in some sense, she had grounds to uh, do something uh, to get Jacob to uh, give her a child. She was previously married to one of his sons who died, and then it became the obligation of his next son to marry her. But he died without giving her a son, so it was now the responsibility of the next son to marry her and have a child. But Jacob was bothered by, and you can understand, two of his previous children dying that married this woman. And so he hides away this other kid and doesn't want him to marry her. This is why she uh, orchestrates this whole thing where she tricks him. She covers herself, and he's out uh, looking uh, on uh, the, the way to somewhere, and he... Uh, happens to to de- take her uh, for uh, relations, and, and it results in having a child. So she's not known for being an especially uh, upright woman. Well, you also have Ruth. Well, Ruth is explicitly called a harlot, Ruth the harlot. She was uh, 
a Jerichoite. She, she lived in Jericho in the city walls. And why does she live in the wall of the city? This is a place where most of the people that visit would encounter people for the first time. And that's where she's making herself available. So she was a harlot. And then you have Bathsheba. Bathsheba is known for having relations with David, even though she was married to Uriah. In fact, Matthew doesn't let you overlook that fact. He doesn't just say Bathsheba, right? David had Solomon through Bathsheba. He says, who was the wife of Uriah the Hittite? He, he goes out of his way to remind you of this, kind of like later in the chapter in Matthew 1, when Matthew tells us that Jesus was conceived and born and fulfilled the Emmanuel prophecy. Right. This is to fulfill what was written in Isaiah, the prophet, the virgin will conceive and bear a child and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, that's what the prophecy says. But then Matthew says, which when translated means this God with us. He wants you to understand the implications of this title. And in fact, this is given as an explanation for why the angel said you're to name him Jesus. You might think there's a disjunct there. I, I don't see how this goes together. The angel said you're to name him Jesus, and Matthew says this was to fulfill what was written by the prophet, that he'd be called Emmanuel. Well, the, the name Jesus means Yahweh saves. He says you're to name him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. So this name identifies him as God. So the, the Emmanuel promise is fulfilled in this. And of course, our Lord has many names, so it wouldn't be a problem at all. But this is something then that Matthew's anticipating, that the gospel's to go forth to the nations. There, there's another example I'll give you, and uh, hopefully you'll leave here and think, I want to keep up this exercise. He stopped in chapter 2 with this idea. I want to continue. Look at chapter 3, chapter 4. But in chapter 2, you have this interesting uh, series of events taking place that really involves a colossal reversal. In, in Matthew 2, you all probably know the, the details here. You have uh, the Magi coming, looking for the king of the Jews. They saw his star in the east. They're following it. And they go to Jerusalem, where you would expect the king to be. And they go to the then puppet king, Herod. And they, they inquire, where is this child that was to be born? And Herod calls in the rabbis, the religious leaders, to, to inform him. Now, we all know Herod was a wicked man. Herod's interest now is piqued, not because he too wants to worship Jesus. He wants to find Jesus and kill him. He's a competitor to his kingship. So the, the king gets the rabbis to come in, and they tell him he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Then Herod instructs the Magi, and he says, okay, you go find that king. When you find him, come back and tell me. And then Matthew tells us he intended to kill them. When the Magi don't come back, then Herod orders the slaughter of the innocents. And then we're told that an angel warned Joseph, take this child down to Egypt. And he records this remarkable prophecy from Hosea, out of Egypt, this was to fulfill what was written by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, many commentators look at this and they think, well, this is strange. It seems out of place. Every time Matthew mentions the fulfillment of something, the fulfillment is always what had just happened. So what should have happened is this statement, this is a very subtle point, but it's, it's a consistent one in Matthew's how he does things. It always follows the what happened. It sounds like the author is calling Israel Egypt. When Jesus is taking, taken out of Israel, it says this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet out of Egypt I called my son. So now look at the whole context in light of this. And, and by the way, this sort of thing is not unattested in Scripture. God constantly denounces Israel by calling it the name of some wicked nation. In the book of Revelation, in fact, in Revelation 11, it talks about the two witnesses prophesying in the streets of the great city. And then it says, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. It's calling Israel Sodom and Egypt, because after all, they're no better than Sodom and Egypt. Well, so think about it. Here you have this foreign king reigning over the people of God. And he wants to slaughter the innocents. Sound like a story you know? Reigning over Israel, a foreign king. And he's going after the children 
in order to kill them. The whole point here is Israel's being portrayed like a new Egypt, and Herod is being portrayed as a new Pharaoh. Jesus is the true son of God, the true Israel that's going to leave. And notice this, the Magi are on the side of Jesus. Who is on the side of Pharaoh? The court magicians, the Magi. Not, not anymore, it's these Gentile Magi. So this is remarkable. Matthew is doing this sort of thing all along the way. So even though Jesus has been sent specifically to Israel, it was not to stop there. This was the initial installment. After that, he was going to send out his disciples to evangelize the world. But first he had to go to them. First he had to fulfill the promises that were made to the fathers. First he had to do the things that scripture said he would do. And then it would go forth to the nations. In fact, this is explicitly stated in Old Testament prophecy. In Isaiah 49, it mentions the servant of the Lord who would come and affect the new covenant and bring about redemption. It says, it is too small a thing for you to save the tribes of Jacob. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles. So it says this one's work will be so significant that to limit it to the Gentiles or to the Jews is hardly adequate. It's hardly adequate. So this is a startling command for these reasons. We don't expect it in certain ways. The Jews didn't expect it. Look at the apostles. After this is given, they're still stumbling all over each other, you know, about how they're supposed to deal with the Gentiles. There's all these things that have to happen. Peter has to be persuaded by a vision to go to speak to Cornelius and not think that Cornelius is unclean and, and to be uh, avoided. So th there's something startling about the command, and th there's certainly something Herculean about it. I, uh, I can't think of another word that uh, gets it for me that this is a huge task. How, how do we do this? There, there are people out there, and you can read it. I mean, when I, one of the first things I did when I became a believer, I read the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, I'm not uh, the quickest in some ways, and uh, I'm a, a, I could be naive, hopefully not as much anymore. I'm not saying I'm not at all, but hopefully not as much anymore. But I was reading this book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and if you haven't read it, it's all about the history of persecution against Christians starting with the apostles and going on century by century. What has happened to Christians as they, as they tried to disciple the nations? And as I read it, and, and I'm hearing of Christians being killed, I just sort of thought this is the ordinary experience of all Christians. And I do think there's a sense in which there's persecution that Christians endure, but it's not all at the same level. Uh, it's relative in, in some respects. But uh, I thought this was the norm, so that having become a Christian any day, they were coming for me. And I'm glad I thought that, as naive as I was, because I learned early on, Christianity isn't, isn't promised to us as a walk in the park. And so I just, I consigned to, uh, to myself from the very beginning to death. I, I just thought I was going to die soon. And so as wrong as I was, it was a good thought, because after that, you know, if I stubbed my toe, I didn't think, oh my gosh. Uh, Christianity is false, right? There are many people who think that way. They think that becoming a Christian means that everything's going to go smoothly for you. And as soon as it doesn't, well, then the gig is up. I'm not a Christian anymore. Well, I thought I was going to die. So anything short of that uh, wasn't going to stop me from being a Christian. So, so the, but the task, again, I keep, I want to drill this home. It's a, it's an incredible task. We're going out into a world that wants to kill Christians and does still kill Christians. There are Christians that are being killed still. And it's always a possibility for us. And, by the way, one of the reasons it becomes an increasing possibility in any place is because Christians aren't doing this. If we're evangelizing, then the people that are around us are evangelized people. They're people that are being made disciples, and those aren't the ones that want to kill you. So, in a sense, by not doing this, you're digging your own grave. So it, it's an incredible task. It's a worldwide task. It's an unending generational task. It's a task that's laid upon the entire church. Now, one of the things I think of when I think of this task that Jesus is giving the church here is Psalm 2, one of my favorite psalms. I hope you all are very familiar with it. But in that psalm, we have, I mean, every bit of it is important 
But it, it's the psalm that begins, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So that shows you the, the, the heart, the nature of the natural man, the unconverted person. This is what gives rise to persecutions. The nations, it says, are hostile to the Lord and his anointed one. But, but notice every word of this. It's all going to be relevant to Matthew 28. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. So there's various ways of rendering this. It, it, it mentions them gathering together, conferring together, taking counsel together. Uh, one way that this is properly interpreted or translated is plotted. They're plotting, they're conspiring, right? But, but you're supposed to see all of this. The peoples gathering together, plotting or conspiring. I'll, I'll come back to that. But it shows you the, the heart of the natural man and the world into which we're going. This is how they view Christ. This is how they view what we're witnessing to them about. But, but should this deter us from this task? It should show us how serious it is, what, what really is uh, uh, great about it. But it goes on. They, they say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Notice this. The picture is of a God who is absolutely sovereign. All the futile efforts of men conspiring against him are of no account. He sits above them in the heavens. Reminds me of Psalm 115, 3. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Or, or Daniel 4, when Nebuchadnezzar comes to his senses. Remember, he's driven mad because he says, look at this great Babylon which I have built by my great power and wisdom. And then God drives him mad and, and into the fields. But then Nebuchadnezzar comes to his senses and he says, I now realize that God reigns in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Nobody can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? God does what he pleases. And that's the point. So the, the people, the nations, they rage. They want to uh, tear off his bonds. His, he's, they, they think of themselves as bound. Uh, these, these are onerous things that he's put upon them. These are, these are laws that are too burdensome to bear. That's their thoughts about these things. And they want to burst his bonds apart. But he sits in heaven. It's of no account. It goes on to say, then he'll speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. My holy hill. Now, you have to understand that Zion is, has a twofold reference in Scripture. Sometimes it could be referring to the earthly Zion, the city of David, where the king dwelt. Or it could refer to the heavenly Zion, where the true king dwells, of whom the earthly king was but a representative. Well, here it's talking about a king that will be established on Zion, and I would contend it means that heavenly Zion, from which he reigns over all things. It's Psalm 110, same person. It says, sit at, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. My right hand, God is dwelling in heaven. His right hand is clearly in heaven. And it goes on, I'll tell the decree of the Lord. He said, the Lord said to me, you're my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Here the psalmist tells us that all this figure has to do is ask. Ask and I'll give it to you. Ask and I'll give you the nations. This sovereign one, the one who's sovereign in heaven above says, ask and I'll give you the nations. Now, I remember going to a church once since I made reference to the name it and claim it group. Uh, I went to a church once where somebody was preaching this text and they said, this verse is all about you. This verse is, is all about you. You're supposed to tell God whatever you want. Ask for the nations. He'll give it to you. And I remember thinking this is something of a ripoff. If, if this is the, the name of the game, right, this is something of a ripoff. Number one, the Mormons down the street were offering entire planets, <laughs> right? You could become a god over your own planet. But not to go further with all of this, this text is saying that the nations belong to the sun. All he has to do is ask for them. So here's the million-dollar question. Do you think he asked? Well, Matthew 28 is the answer. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe 
all things that I have commanded you. Now, now, by the way, notice something else about that command. The command to make disciples presupposes evangelism, but it goes beyond that. It's discipleship you're teaching. But notice teaching them to observe whatsoever things I've commanded you. That's, you know, we're not just being told to get people to say, I believe in Jesus. We're being told to teach them what Christ commanded and to do it. Now, now if you didn't think it was hard before, how, how, how now do you think? Uh, how often do you do what, what he commanded or don't do it? Right. So you, you are one of those people being discipled. We're all being discipled. Right. And uh, it, it's an endless thing. But that's a huge task. It's as huge as you needing to not disobey. How many you know, when you disobey, that's you falling short in your discipleship. So it's a huge task. It's a lifelong task for just for you to become sanctified. And so imagine we're, we're supposed to do this with all the nations. Again, I think this is incredible. Many of these nations want to kill us. Many of these nations are killing us. How could we possibly do this? Well, that's something of the uh, requirement. Well, but if you look back at Matthew 18, how does it begin? What is the preface to this? In, Ma in Matthew 28, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's claiming the authority of the one mentioned in Psalm 2. The father who, who sits in the heavens and laughs at them above all their petty efforts to overthrow him. He says, I've installed my king on Zion. The Lord Jesus is his king. He has all authority. He has all authority. He's the one now who can say what happens in heaven and on earth. Right? Nobody can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, of course, I should say this has always been true of Jesus with respect to his divine nature. He's always been equal with the Father. Right Before this time in, in John 5, for example, I love the, uh, the, the whole story there. But in John 5, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. It's almost like he was waiting. Uh, every time I see these miracles happening on the Sabbath, it's like Jesus sees a person in need, but he waits till Saturday just so he can irk the Jews who thinks he's doing something wrong. Well, a number of times when Jesus is challenged for his work on the Sabbath, he gives one answer or another. Uh, go look at them. There's different answers that Jesus gives. Sometimes he just says, uh, you know, look what David did on the Sabbath. There are certain things that are okay to do on the Sabbath that are built into the law. They're right there. David did it. And if David could do it and not be condemned by God, then clearly I can do it, the son of David. And more than that, the Lord of the Sabbath. He says, so uh, Jesus gives various answers. But in John five, Jesus said this, my father has been working to this very day. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of it. Maybe, you know, but first grasp this. What he's saying is this. It's, it's in Greek. Fancy terminology is it's a present of past action still in progress. He's saying my father has been working throughout the past up until the present uninterruptedly. Right? In, in the creation account, we read that God rested, and it just means from the work of creation, ex nihilo creation, creating from nothing. But he doesn't stop working absolutely. If he did, the world would cease to exist. He upholds the world. He governs the world. He's ceaselessly active. And so Jesus is saying, my father's been working this very day. Do you think he's a, a, a Sabbath breaker? Right? He's not a Sabbath breaker, so apparently some things can be done on the Sabbath. But then he says this, and this is what gets them. Me too. My father's been working to this very day, and I too have been working or am working. It's Again, it's the present of past actions. It's, he's saying, my father's been working throughout the past up until the present, and so have I. And that's why the Jews want to kill him, because it says in the text, not only was he breaking the Sabbath in their eyes, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So simply by virtue of being the eternal son of the father, he's equal with God. But in Matthew 28, Jesus is now speaking of it in, in a new sense. He speaks of it being given to him. He means now in his mediatorial role, he has fulfilled in our nature the, the commands that God had laid upon him. He fulfilled the terms of the covenant. And now he's receiving this right as the mediator, as the God man. He's receiving it in our nature and wielding all authority because of this. And by the way, the same sort of thing happens in the Old Testament with respect to God. 
Uh, it says in Gen uh, Deuteronomy 33, for example, when God had delivered the people at the Exodus, he accomplished this great feat. It says the Lord became king in, uh, over Jeshurun. Jeshurun is an old word for Israel. But notice that he became king over them. Was he not king before that? No, it's just saying through his, these redemptive feats, he brings to pass uh, something uh, about his king. He brings it, uh, if you will, uh, uh, in, into the experience of people, or uh, it's realized in a certain way, it's manifested in a certain way. Uh, this language is used throughout the Old Testament. It talks about God ascending. It talks about God being exalted. How can God be exalted? And God is repeatedly exalted in the Old Testament. He was exalted over the people and so forth. So this is consistent with Old Testament language, but e even if it weren't, it's being used here in the sense of Jesus I mean, even if it weren't consistent with the language that's used for God all the time, here it's being used of Jesus in particular as the mediator. In our nature, he's now received this authority and wields it. And so think now about that Herculean task. I said it's a huge task. You know, why should we make disciples? That's one of the questions that I was given to address. Why should we make disciples? Well, there's a very easy answer. The one who has all authority in heaven and on earth told you to. Does there need to be anything more than that? I couldn't imagine. Does there need to be anything more than that? There doesn't. But I will tell you, there is more than that. The thing that really gets me the most is Scripture portrays the, the nations, the people that come to salvation as the rewards of the Son. They are His rewards for His redemptive labor. Notice that's what's happening in Psalm 2. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations. It's because of what He does. He's now being promised all these things. All these things I'll give you. These are the rewards of Christ's redemptive labors. In, in Isaiah 53, it says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. What does that mean? It's saying he'll look at all the suffering he endured, and the, the results, in light of the results of it, he'll be satisfied. He's going to be rejoicing, delighted in this. There are other texts that speak to this. He'll delight in this. So I think by bringing people to Christ, I'm delighting the one who saved me. This is to his delight. This is what he did it for. This is why he endured it. I mean, none of us could imagine, really, I don't think any of us can fully understand what Christ endured at the cross in, in, in this sense. I mean, there's a lot of senses, but uh, he's not just suffering physically. He's suffering spiritually. He's enduring divine judgment. But I, I often think, you know, I do prison ministry. I I do prison ministry now because I was converted in prison. I went to prison at 18 years old, 30 years ago, not robbing a bank. I stole a car and I uh, got in trouble and I went to, to jail and I did two and a half years. I got out and always wanted to go back in and eventually did. So I'm, I'm entirely grateful. I could, I, I've told people before if I wasn't married and had, didn't have kids, I had nobody that I was responsible to. They could stick me back in the jail and I'd stay there. I really would. I mean, I, I may not like uh, some aspects of it. I might say, let's skip the culinary part. Cause, but but uh, I mean, that's just my delight. I think the Lord saved me. Uh, send me back. I, I'll go back. It, it's, you know, and those were beautiful years to me. I had all sorts of time. I could read the Bible and uh, endlessly. So, and, and people are all around you. They can't go anywhere, right? Uh, now they can kill you. But, but you've got captive audience. You get to wit. You can't just, just tell me, you, you know, you're not going to talk to me because you're my next door neighbor. You're my bunkie, whatever. But uh, the, the the fact that uh, I was there and I had done something wrong, I, I had suffered, but I suffered for doing something wrong. Now, uh, imagine, though, somebody who's never done anything wrong, suffering. Anytime I've suffered when I didn't do the thing that I'm suffering for, somebody's doing something to me or whatever, I always think, well, I've done plenty of things for which this is a fitting uh, thing for me, right? I can always at least say, well, I've done something else if I didn't do that. I can always identify with it in some way. But here's Jesus. What was Jesus convicted and condemned for. Think about this. Now, now there's, there's all sorts of things going on at the trial, and so there's probably various answers that can be given. But what the Jews try to do with the Romans is condemn him as 
a, a claimant on Caesar's rights, right? He, they say he's claiming to be a king. They're just bringing that up because they want Rome to kill him. But their problem was he's a blasphemer. Blasphemy is as bad as it gets from an Old Testament perspective. It was punishable by death. It's not just heresy. It's not just believing false things about God. It's speaking evil of God. Here's Jesus. What, what was more true of Jesus than that he loved his father? The, the, the triune God in Matthew 28, it's the triune God into whose name people are baptized. Right? This shows that from all eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have dwelt in eternal communion, fellowship, love. Right? The Father has loved the Son for all eternity. Uh, Matthew 3, it says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The idea is all my love reposes in this one. That's where all my love is. And so anybody who's in the Son, by the way, is a recipient of that love. We are beloved in the beloved, righteous in the righteous one, and so forth. Well, the Father has loved the Son from all eternity. The Son has loved the Father from all eternity. There's nothing further from his mind. There's nothing more contrary to his nature than blaspheming the Father. And here he is being accused of blasphemy. The best way I've been able to think of this is, what if I was accused of some horrendous thing that I didn't do? I mean, I'm not even going to name it, because. but just imagine it. You're accused of this. Now there's loved ones, family members, people wondering, is this true? You know, I mean, there's going to be some room for doubt there, uh, you know, uh, and, and I'm just thinking, gosh, this would be horrendous. I, I'm, I'm accused of this uh, and I'm suffering for this. And now I've got all these people who know me as a minister and all these things, and they all think now I've done this dastardly deed. Well, this is Jesus. There's nothing worse than having been accused of blasphemy and he's dying on the cross for it. That's incredible. When I think about that, I think he deserves the nation's. He deserves the name. Remember, by the way, he's the one of whom the seraphim were crying, or to whom, when it says, holy, holy, holy. John tells us that was Jesus. I, I don't know if you've noticed it in John 12, but he quotes Isaiah 6, and he says, Isaiah said these things because he saw Christ's glory and spoke of him. It was Jesus that the angels were crying out, not just Jesus, the Father and the Spirit too. And in fact, in Acts 28, for example, Paul quotes that section of Isaiah and says this was spoken by the Spirit. So when you go to Isaiah 6 and the Lord speaks, Paul says it was the Spirit. When you go to Isaiah 6 and you see the Lord in his glory, John says that was Jesus. So here you have a picture of the triune God, and no wonder that the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is the God of Christian faith. We believe in a triune God. It is this God into whose name we are baptized. It is this God who be, uh to whom we become disciples. So the, the reason that we should disciple people is because we were commanded to do it, and we were commanded to do it by this Jesus, this Jesus who endured incredible, horrendous suffering and death. Well, I don't know how much time I've taken, but uh, I do have uh, at least two more things to say. And uh, uh, hopefully I've taken enough time and not too much time, but I've got no sense of time is my problem. And so, uh, so there's another thing here. So it's still a Herculean task. I, I've told you why you should do it, but does it cease being the incredible task that I've been describing? It, it doesn't. How does this get you any further along the way in thinking, I can do this, or we can do this, or we can be part of this? He's commanded it. It, it is what it is, the command. So what assurance can we possibly have that we can do this? Well, that's where the promise comes in in verse 20. Verse 20, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. The one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, who gave us this command, he said, I'm with you. I am with you always to the ends of the ages. I can't tell you how much this helps me. I know it's helped Christians throughout the ages. I'm far from the first or the last, but... I only know my own inner thoughts, right? And, and uh, when I go and talk to people, I always think they're outnumbered. I mean, always, because uh, I remember, and I think I told some of you this the other day, I was once, uh, I went to, uh, I was at a conference with a group of Christians, and we had a theological difference. We're all friends, all love each other, all friends in, in the Lord. And there was uh, 10 of them seated at this table, and I was there with another friend. And I walked up, and they said, well, looks like someone's outnumbered here. And I said, oh, I said, I, 
I, okay, I said, I'll, I'll even the odds up. I'll have my friend leave. <laughs> but my, the, the point is, that's how all Christians should think when they go into a witnessing encounter. That person does not have a leg up on you at all. You have with you the Lord Jesus. And, and I, I mean, I can tell you, as feeble as you are, I mean, I often feel as I preach sometimes, I'm thinking that, that was poorly executed. I sure hope it was of some good to people. Uh, and, but I, I hear people say this blessed them or benefited them. And I don't think for that reason uh, that I didn't do as poorly as I thought. I just think the Lord took what I did and he made more out of it, just like he does with bread and other things. So this is huge. I, I, I've told the story recently, so I don't know if you've heard this one too, but I remember we were going to do an outreach to Mormons and I had been studying Mormonism for over a decade and there were a bunch of people that were new at the church that were part of a little training that we did. And we went out and there was this young girl and she just, she was having remarkable success with people left and right. People are confessing Christ and so forth. And, uh, here I, I was having some great arguments with people, right? My, my, my point is that, uh, I mean, I'm not saying nobody uh, confesses Christ through my limited efforts, but I never presume upon uh, myself thinking it, anything is happening because of me and how great I might think I did it or how bad I think I did it. The whole point is it's God who causes it to be fruitful. It's God who causes the increase. And so that's the value of this promise. Lo, I am with you always to the ends of the ages. These are his disciples. He's the one who has an interest in them coming to him. Do you think he's not there with you and at work with you and at work in them when you're doing this? So this should be a powerful assurance to you. This is not an impossible task. It's not an impossible task. It's a very doable task. We've been commanded to do it by the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. We've been uh, promise that he'll be with us. But now let me address a little bit what is entailed in discipleship. Not just the why, but the how. We've addressed the why, I think, pretty amply, and I've left myself little time for the uh, the rest of it. I'm being told I can keep going. So if you guys don't think I should be, then you have to blame a couple of parties here. No. Uh, well, what does it mean? What does it look like to make disciples? Well, one of the things that I want to really press is the importance of the Bible. There's nothing more important than scripture in this. I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of very weighty things, prayer, fellowship, maybe I'll get to all those, but they shouldn't be neglected. But, but the Bible is of inestimable value. Why, why would that be? I mean, think about it. I mean, there's, there's a number of things here, but, um, well, I'll give you one example, practical example. When I became a believer, well, first of all, I read the Bible. My, the order for me was different than it is for a lot of people. A lot of people hear the gospel preached and they become believers and then they start reading their Bibles. Or maybe they've read a book of the Bible or something like that. Somebody told them to read John or something. All of this is good. You know, my, my experience is not the norm. Uh, you know, it's not a standard. Like everybody has to come this way. In my case, somebody sort of provoked me to read the Bible, and I was only reading it for entertainment purposes, right? I, I, you could have had enter, for entertainment purposes only or whatever on the cover. That's what I thought I was doing. I'm just reading it because I got nothing else. I was in a prison cell. I guess I already told you that. So I can go. I was, I was trying to avoid that because I'm thinking, then I got to tell you all these details. But I was in prison, and a devil worshiper said, all this stuff about the Bible. He was my roommate. He would draw pentagrams above my bed. I'd wake up and see it. He was a nice guy, but not all there. Um, well, he, he, he would tell me stuff about the Bible. And eventually I was like, I think you're just making this stuff up. It doesn't even sound like, you know, a couple billion people believe in Christianity and you're over here acting like it's just this bad. Right. And, uh, stupid bad like just really dumb stuff and you know i mean and you can imagine stuff that people will say this this part is true he says that you know it has a talking snake in it that part's true now it's strange because he's the guy that follows the snake so i don't know why he's upset but but he you know he says you know it's got talking snakes well think about it according to atheists all of us are talking animals right so the bible's got one or two talking animals, you guys have seven billion, right? Um, but uh, yeah, he told me a bunch of stuff that I just didn't think was true. And so he told me how to get a Bible. I got a Bible and I started reading it. 
a lot of time on my hands. I read the whole thing in two months. In the jail, that's when you're still being uh, tried. You're going through your court case and you're not con uh, convicted yet. So you, you get like 16 hours in your room and eight maybe, maybe out in the common area with the other people. Well, after that, you get moved to the prison if you're convicted and you go to a quarantine spot where they, they keep you in a cell with one guy for 23 hours a day and you only get out for one to shower and do laps around the, the unit or something. But uh, now then I, I read the Bible again in one month because I had a whole lot more time. So I read the Bible twice before believing, at least. And I heard it growing up to some degree. I heard people talk about it and I had been in church. I never paid attention really, but it was, it was there. It was there in the air kind of thing. And in fact, there's an interesting story about that that you can ask me about later. But uh, I read the Bible. I was convicted by it. I realized that God is holy, 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 and I am not, not, not. And it was terrifying to me. I didn't understand the gospel. It wasn't until somebody preached the gospel that I actually understood it. That's what Paul says, too, is that, that God especially blesses the preaching of the word. The word, to be sure, but it's the preaching of it that he especially favors to use in the conviction and conversion of sinners. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How can they hear unless there's a preacher? How is there a preacher unless he's sent? That's what Paul says. So he's thinking specifically of the preached word. Well, uh, I become a Christian through this, but this means now, though, that I'm in a pretty good position as far as the word is concerned. I'm not... Uh, necessarily or as easily going to fall for just anything, because there were a lot of groups there representing Christianity. I had a guy who was part of one of these word faith groups, and he was telling me things like, you need to have the God kind of faith. I was like, what in the world is that? And he, he'd say, that's, that's, you know, the God kind of faith is where you can proclaim it. And it, and it is, right? You call it into being. That's the God kind of faith. And I said, why are you calling it the God kind of faith? He goes, because that's the faith God has, right? God has that kind. I said, God doesn't have faith. What are you talking about? And then he says, oh, yes, he does. He says, the Bible says God is faithful. And I said, so? And he says, that means full of faith. And I said, oh, that, that's like saying basketful means full of basket, right? Or uh, that, that just isn't what faithful means. It means to be true and consistent and so forth. So, but I was in good stead. People couldn't just tell me anything. And one of the things that I heard a year in, I started hearing a lot of people attack the Trinity, the triune God, and say, that's not in the Bible. It was invented at Nicaea. And I'd think, well, that's strange. I've never heard of this Nicaea thing, but the triune God, I, I read his word every day. That's, I've learned that in the Bible. Nobody had to tell me that. I mean, it's not that I didn't have other Christians and stuff, but I, I would turn the page and uh, think, is you know, here's the Trinity. There's a, there's a divine person talking to another divine person. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. What, what's the Lord talking to the Lord for? Right In Isaiah, it talks about the Lord sending the Lord. Uh, there, are, there are passages like this all over the Bible. In Hosea 1.7, one of my favorites, it talks about the future. It says, God says, I will save them not by sword or horses or horsemen, but by the Lord, their God. That's a weird way to speak, isn't it? I'll, I'll save them by the Lord their God. Well, we know in light of the New Testament what that means. Uh, not that it's only the new, but I'm just saying that it, there it becomes especially clear. So knowing the word is of inestimable value. Nobody could tell me I was believing this because of a council that I didn't know anything about. I'm not putting down the council. I think it was a tremendously important council. It's just a fact, though, that... The Bible has to be the foundation for what I believe. And, and knowing that, nobody can, can shake my faith by saying something like that. If I know that it's in the Bible, then people can talk all day long about it being invented by this person or that person. Right? That, that's one thing. It gives you incredible confidence. On, in addition to the one who's got all authority told you to go and do this, now you, you have the confidence of his word. It's like a rock beneath your feet. But think also of what Jesus says in John 15. Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. There he talks about abiding in him. And he says, if you abide in my word, right, then you're my disciples. 
is explicitly talking about discipleship. That's what it means to be a disciple is to abide in his word. He says, if my word is in you, right, then you'll bring forth much fruit. It's the whole point. This is how you bring forth fruit, the word abiding in you. How can it abide in you if you're not in it? How can the spirit bring these things to your remembrance if there's nothing there to remember? This is the interesting story I was going to say, by the way, so you don't have to ask me afterwards, but it's, it fits right here. But uh, when I became a believer, I remembered certain verses, and, but I knew that I would cite them at times in the King James. Uh, today, my go-to English translation is the New American Standard. I also like the ESV. But when I grew up, I, I heard everything in the King James Version, and I didn't understand where these verses, somebody told me one time, why are you saying them in King James? Do you read the King James? And I was like, I don't even know what that is, because I didn't know what the version was that we read as a kid. Uh, but the whole point here is I was remembering verses now that I had not thought of since I was a toddler. They came back to me somehow, and I was just reciting them this way. I don't mean like I'm just reciting books or something. I'm just saying there's, there's a handful of verses that I knew, and I didn't know why I knew them in this form, given that the translation I had at the time wasn't the King James. And uh, it, it, later I learned, my mom told me, she taught me how to read using the King James Bible. Uh, I, we did memory verses and that sort of thing. But here are these verses I hadn't thought of in uh, almost a lifetime at that point. I'm 18, 19 years old, and these were all things that were part of my childhood, like five, six, and so forth. These came back to me. So imagine it now as a Christian. You're reading the Word. You have the Spirit. These are things that He's implanting in you and bringing to your remembrance. Uh, I had a pastor that he always used to say, and this, this always stuck with me too, he used to say, learn these lessons in the light so that when the darkness comes, you don't stumble. And what he was saying is he would preach a text about something that maybe you have not experienced and hopefully won't experience. But the whole point is, you learn these things now before they happen. Because when they happen, it's a tough time to learn the lesson at that point. Right? I, I've had certain challenges where I have to make an ethical decision. It's not the right time to try and decide what the right ethical decision is when certain consequences follow from your choice. Because these consequences might weigh on your choice. You may not be looking at them in as clear a way as you should be. So when you, when you look at what the word says apart from the experience and you come to a settled conclusion, when the thing happens and you're confronted with it, there's no question. You know what the right thing to do is. The word has told you. But well, think about this. Here's one more reason uh, to think of how important the word is. In I mentioned Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is part of the introduction to the Psalter. I don't have time to work all this out, but... Uh, the first two Psalms are viewed as the introductory chapters. Books in the Bible have introduction. They're, they're extremely important. Uh, think of reading the book of Job without the first two chapters. Uh, you've got Job and his friends sitting around trying to figure out why Job is suffering. And some are saying that uh, Job has done something wrong. Some are saying God's done something wrong. <laughs> and uh, you, know, you wouldn't be any the wiser than these guys in this context. But you're supposed to be wiser because you've been given the prologue. You know what's going on. Satan aims to uh, tempt Job, and, and God is permitting the test and so forth. So you have an understanding of what's happening. It's the same thing in the Gospels. When you go through the Gospel of Mark, you have people stumbling along and saying, Who is this man? Where did he get this wisdom? How do such works flow from his hands? They're, they're wondering about this. But you're not supposed to be wondering because the gospel opens the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, so you know who this is. When they say, who is this, you're supposed to be saying, the Son of God, right? So prologues are important. Well, the prologue to the Psalter are the first, or is the first two chapters. Psalm 1 and 2 are really a unit. I, I, even as I'm telling you this, I'm thinking... Careful, because I, I feel like going off for an hour on it. This is, this is wonderfully good stuff. But, uh, and again, I don't mean my preaching. I just mean this, this content. This is, to me, it, it, it always gets me excited. But uh, Psalm 1 is sometimes read by people in, I think, a uh, reductionistic way. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So that's, that's the psalm. You, that bring, I'm hoping that brings it to your remembrance, right? There's more to the psalm. But 
the way people read this psalm is they think the, the man just means, if I say the man who runs five miles a day will have good cardio. So you think that's just any man, right? Any person who does this. But I, that's not what's going on in Psalm 1. It's not talking about just any person in general. It's talking about a particular man. Blessed is the man. Ashrei ha'ish. It's got the definite article in Hebrew. The man. Ha'ish. Who is this man of whom the psalmist is speaking? It says, he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But what does this man do, this particular man? It says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So if you're following me and, and thinking along with me that this is Jesus, it's telling you Jesus meditates in the law of God day and night. That's what he did. The Lord Jesus meditated in the law of God day and night, and if he did that, how much more should we? How do you think Jesus could rebuff Satan's temptations in the wilderness by citing scripture? Repeatedly, it is written, it is written, it is written. And how often did he do this in his confrontations with the religious leaders? Have you never read? It, this is so obvious that if you had just read it, then you'd know. Jesus was saturated with scripture. He could say in the volume of the book, it is written of me. In Hebrews 10, it's quoting Psalm 40. In Luke 24, Jesus walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus gives them a Bible study lesson. Do you think he was pulling you know, all these scrolls out as they walked along? No, these are all right there. He's, he's telling them all this stuff from memory. Jesus meditated in the law. Now, here's something marvelous about this. In the Hebrew, the, the syntax is very different. And what I'm telling you is not contested by Jews, though they don't like it. The, the syntax, so, so in our English translations, it usually says, uh, well, maybe I should look at it, but it, it, usually, it usually orders it in a way that obscures precisely what's being said. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. So it says his delight is in the law of the Lord. In the Hebrew, it says, in the law of the Lord, so that's how it starts, in the law of the Lord is his delight. So it's talking about the blessed man. In the law of the Lord is his delight, and in his, the blessed man's, law, he meditates day and night. It's calling the law his law. He meditates in his own law. A remarkable picture, isn't it? Now, here's why this is so significant. One of the reasons why these two chapters, this is not the end of the story, but one of the reasons these two chapters are viewed as a unit, as the introduction to the Psalter, is because they have what's called an inclusio around them. That's where it's a literary device, where somebody begins something one way and ends something the same way. And they're, so they're, they're like two great bookends. They're, they're, they're holding everything together or they're pointing to what's in between them. Well, Psalm 1, sometimes when I point this out to people, they think, well, you've just robbed this psalm then of its practical relevance to me if you've made it about Jesus. And I think, well, how, pray tell, is that true? If, if anything is true of you, it's because you are in Jesus, right? If you are righteous, it's because you're in Jesus. If you're being sanctified, it's because you're in Jesus, right? God has made him to be wisdom for us. That is our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, right? All these things are true in Jesus. Everything that we're told to do, to put off sin, to put on righteousness, he speaks of it as being clothed with Christ. We're putting off the old man, putting on the new man. So this being about Jesus doesn't mean it's no longer relevant to you. But watch what, the, what, watch what happens, the inclusio. In Psalm 1, it says, blessed is the man. That's how it starts. The last verse of Psalm 2 says, blessed. So blessed is the man who does not do all these things. And at the end of Psalm 2, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So he is the blessed man, and we are blessed if our trust is in him. That's the point. And who is this man? It's the son of Psalm 2. It's the anointed one. It's the king. So see the importance of the word. The Lord Jesus, the word himself, meditates on this word. It's his word. He comes in the flesh, and he does exactly what we're supposed to do. And if he did it, how much more should we? This is of inestimable importance. You can't Lie to yourself about your sin if you know the word. I mean, you could try, but it becomes harder and, and harder and harder, right? To, harder to, to rationalize, but unless, you know, that's your intention from the outset. But the, the word is what teaches you right and wrong. The word is what teaches you true and false. The word is what leads you along the path of discipleship.
It informs your discipleship. It directs your discipleship. So memorize the word. Get your children to memorize the word. Uh, starting young is, is the best thing possible. But it's not impossible if you're starting even just now. So I don't want to leave anybody with that impression. I'm just saying the, the sooner the better. I, I often look at, I'm, I'm one of these people that I look at this huge task sometimes and, and I spend more time thinking about how big this task is. And, and an hour afterwards, I'm thinking, gosh, if I had gotten started an hour ago, I might be finished with this big task by now. Uh, but so some people look at the, the Bible and they think, oh, that's just, you know, memorize it. I mean, is that too big a task? I mean, or, or memorize a whole book. Uh, some people look at that and think, well, that's, that's huge. Uh, yes, it's huge. <laughs> Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the ages, right? Uh, this is a huge task, but it's an incredibly rewarding task. It's one that you've been called to. It's the way of discipleship. This is how you'll be an effective evangelist, how you'll be an effective anything uh, in a godly fashion. If you want to do it in a godly way, this is how you'll be effective, by his word not by some other standard. This word, this word dwelling in you richly, as Paul says, is what will ultimately produce that godly fruit that Jesus says marks his disciples. So the one thing that I'm uh, hopeful that you'll really get is this idea of the, of the importance of, of learning the word, of uh, inculcating it into uh, all of your thoughts. One of the ways, let me give you some practical things uh, along these lines before I conclude. W one of the things that Older Christians focused on a lot more than we do, I think. Maybe not you in particular or here at this church, but uh, they often talked about what they called a middle duty, a middle duty between reading the word and prayer. Uh, it's an interesting way of talking, but what they, uh, what they were referring to is meditation, not Zen Buddhist meditation, but this kind of meditation mentioned in Psalm 1, the, the righteous man meditates in the law of God. What does that mean? He's not meditating on nothing, right, like the Buddhist. He's meditating on the law. And this idea is he's, he's rolling it over in his mind, and, and it's, it's even coming to expression on his tongue. He's walking along the way and just sort of verbalizing, and he's talking about it, he's thinking about it. They called it a middle duty because what they're saying is we, we read the word. This is God's word to us. And then we are to meditate on that word, and as a result of meditating on that word, that results in prayer. We now know how to pray. How do you not know how to pray when in the word you're told how to pray? Matthew 6, the disciples said, teach us how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, right? The word teaches you how to pray. And then you've got all these prayers to boot. There's prayers all over the Bible, all over. First Kings 8, the great Solomonic prayer before the, the temple, uh, at, for the dedication of the temple. Many of the Psalms are called prayers. We have prayers in the Bible. So they called meditation a middle duty. What you should do when you hear a sermon, this is always what I try to do, is I leave there thinking he's only started my thoughts on this topic. I'm supposed to continue this. And throughout, what do I do throughout the day? Uh, when I, you know, Whatever I'm doing, I should be meditating on this. I used to drive a bus in the city of Las Vegas at 10 hours a day for 10 years before I went to seminary. And it was all kinds of exciting, by the way. Um, there's all kinds of craziness that happens on the Vegas streets. And if you're a bus driver, you're sometimes the getaway driver without knowing it. Um, honestly, I, I would get messages saying, watch out for this person. They just, you know, threaten somebody at the mall or whatever. And uh, I've had times when the bus is surrounded because they think that the suspect is in the bus and so forth. Had people pull guns on me, threaten me, swing at me. It, it was a really, really fun. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it also had its downtime. There, there were monotonous periods. I'd be bored. I'd be thinking I could be at home reading or something. That was like the thing I wanted to do all the time. And I, so I'd be driving along and I thought, what can I do to make this not so uh, boring? You know, and I like driving in itself, but the, some of it's just back and forth in traffic, stopping, going, and, and so forth. And so one of the things that I started doing was I decided that I would take some portion of Scripture, and it would be that thing that I would try and return my mind to throughout the day as I was working. And through that, I began to memorize some of the stuff. Even then, it wasn't the intention to memorize, though that, too, I would say is part of what you should be doing with respect to the Word and discipleship. It was just the fact that I'm 
I const I'm constantly looking at this to think about it. And I'm thinking, what are all the implications of this? How does this connect with other passages in Scripture? Uh, what are the practical results of this? So this is a practical way to do things. You know, you, uh, I think I heard somebody mention that uh, they work in a warehouse. I worked at a warehouse when I was in seminary, and my seminary period was grueling too, not like the bus uh, things. Nobody was pulling guns on me at the seminary. But while I was in seminary, I was going to school full time. I had a family, four kids. Uh, I had a full time job. My youngest got sick while I was going to seminary with a protracted illness. And so my wife, who was working part time, because my full time work, when, when I left Vegas, the, the, the transportation job, I made good money. But when I went to seminary, I was leaving all that. I went, right? Go there for, I went. That's part of the challenge of that verse, by the way. Going means you're leaving something and uh, there's loss potentially involved. Well, I, I went and uh, when my wife couldn't supplement our income with part-time work, I had to pick up additional work. So I had two full-time jobs before I was done with seminary. And one of the jobs that I had was in a warehouse and I had to, the, the job entailed taking a big cart and going around and gathering items and then bringing them up to somebody who's going to package them up and then ship them off to people. And so one of the things I did, I'm thinking, how do I do my seminary work and, and work here too and get sleep? Well, sleep didn't really happen as much, but one of the things I did was I had this big old cart. It had like three racks on it. I took papers of the Bible and, you know, Hebrew grammar or Greek words, uh, so forth. I put them up there. So as I'm running around, I'm using the bottom racks to put things onto it, but I'm constantly able to look at this and, and memorize things. Right? There's, there's so many ways you can do stuff. It's incredible. It's not undoable. It, it, it's just undone, typically. People don't do it, but you can do it. You can do it. And why should you do it? I'll, I'll conclude. I'll wrap up with this. Why should you do it? because the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth told you to do it. And why can you have the confidence that you can do it? Because he said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And I'll conclude with that in prayer. Now, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that we would treasure it. It tells us of you. It tells us who we are, and it tells us what we're to do. Help us to look into your word, to learn of you more, and to be more like you, and to do more like you. We ask and pray this in Christ's name. Amen.